Hello everybody, this is Carrie with Unicorn Company Podcast. So, first of all, I want to apologize because this is technically a day late, although it's not a dollar short, so, you know, I don't have dollars to give. Uh, second of all, I um, wanted to actually, well, shoot. Okay, so it's going to be a little bit off the cuff and I do apologize for that. But there's a reason, because there's been a lot of news moving really quick as far as Battletech. And as you all know, we start off with the news, so this is going to be the news segment right here. And it's a heck of a poor... uh, I know the word and I can't forget it. Or can't remember it. I am really having a bad day. (laughs) No, it's not a bad day. It's just like, my brain's a little scattered. it got a lot of stuff on my brain, a lot of stuff on my mind, what's going on with the, a lot of things. And I've been feeling in a funk. That's why this is, this is, that's why this is a day late. Anyway, so let's talk about news. Um, first of all, they released the map from Tamar Rising. And I think I saved a copy. I will try to post a copy of it in the Facebook group it is nuts um basically the entire Jade Falcon occupation zone essentially balkanized you have like four or five micro states clan health horses grab the oh I can't remember which which side it is They're not spin word anti spin no not spin word no. core word the core word portion of the uh, occupation zone including the dark nebula at least on the map it's it is really really interesting and it makes me wonder what's going to be in store for all of the factions where you have a lot of this stuff going on where you have sudden power vacuums uh, such as on the free worlds league wolf empire border the mess that's going on with the federated sons and the draconis combine you know there's just a lot of a lot of room for what could happen and you know it seems pretty interesting the other piece of big news oh also tamar rising was available at gen con i didn't go i wish i had but i don't want COVID 19 and i don't want um to spend that much money to go to gen con and have to wear masks and all that and anyway The other thing, the other piece of big news, which is pretty interesting, and nobody saw it coming, which I thought this was really awesome. Um, So, Barnes & Noble, I have to double check, I believe it's Barnes & Noble, they are getting a Battletech um, force pack all of their own. So... If you go to Barnes and Noble, and yes, I'm doing this as I'm talking to you, so I do apologize. So type in Barnes and Noble BattleTech in Google. Let's see what pops up. Do 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 do. Barnes and Noble. Okay, so like the first actual result is their BattleTech Game of Armor Combat um, thing that pops up. And that they sell for $60. But let's see if what they have under related. Nope, 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 nope. Okay, give me one moment. I am going to actually get the direct information for this. That way we can actually... uh, Y'all can go and buy it as much as you want. I think it's pre-order. So I think it's like a Christmas type thing or close to it. But anyway, give me one moment. And I'm going to be right back with all the info. Okay, so I'm actually on the site. If you type in Barnes & Noble Wolf Dragoons into Google, it pulls it up. It's uh, The product is Battletech Force Pack Wolf Dragoons Assault Star BN Exclusive. It costs $30. Qualifies for free shipping, at least for me. I don't know about everybody. Um, do, 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 pre, it's a pre-order. Available for pre-order. This item will be available December 15th of 2021. <sighs> It does. I, I do have to resist the urge to just buy it. <laughs> I mean, they're pretty models. I, I give you that. And let's see if I can get a good look at the back of it. So, 
this is an assault star. It's it's not. Um, oh, it's so tiny. So it gives a little description of the Wolf's Dragoons on the back. And then it says the contents, five Alpha Strike cards, five high, high quality, fully assembled, unpainted miniatures, ten Mech Warrior cards. And the mechs that come in it are... Four of them are, are bog standard things you can get through the, the force packs as it is. You have a Mad Cat, which you can get in the, um, in the starter box. An Archer. A blackjack, which is a quite nice looking blackjack, actually. I would be tempted, excuse me, I would be tempted to use that as the blackjack omni and use the old blackjack miniature as a standard blackjack. The rifleman, and then it has one exclusive miniature, which is the annihilator, which, oh my god, beautiful, beautiful model. I've heard people say, oh, it looks pregnant. Well, yeah, it's an Annihilator. They all look pregnant. I mean, it's... It's bulbous. But it's bulbous death. <laughs> um, let's see. Do they have anything else about it on here? No. I do not see anything else about it. So, okay. Actually, no. Uh, so there's a little... In the overview, there's a little blurb about the Wolf's Dragoons. There's the stuff on the back of it. And then this. The Barnes & Noble exclusive expansion set includes the new Annihilator, as well as a reposed Timberwolf and Rifleman, which I did think they looked interesting, and new variants of the Archer and Blackjack. No assembly required, along with 10 Mech Warrior Pilot cards and 5 Alpha Strike cards per, per Battletech and Alpha Strike action. Okay, so the Archer, let me look at it real quick. What do we got here? Okay, give me a second. I'm going to pause. I'm going to count the number of tubes on this launcher. Yes, uh, I, I know. So, give me a sec. Okay, so it has two LRM-20 launchers. You cannot see the rest of the weapons. So, that tells me that either A, they're being cheeky, they snuck in Jamie Wolf's ride, and they're not going to tell anybody until you go open it up, and there's a pilot card for Jamie Wolf, and it has the, the um, Jamie Wolf Archer as the, the card. Or it's just like one of the variants that... You know, I think there's like a large, dual large laser variant in the Archer or something like that. There's some weird variants out there. So, we'll see what it is. I mean, this could be Jamie Wolf's Ride. This could just be another Archer. Because I think there, we have the Archer Kel, don't we? Yes. So, it wouldn't surprise me if they did the Archer Wolf as well. Um, let's see. I think that's about it for news. Um, obviously, like I said, I didn't go to Gen Con. I haven't heard anything horrible about everybody, anybody that went to Gen Con. I haven't heard anything crazy about it. I do know Wolf, uh, the Wolf's Dragoon... No, not Wolf's Dragoon. WolfNet Radio Podcast held a tournament in... Um, shoot. At the Battle Barn up there. I haven't looked at the results. But, you know, so I mean, that's most of what I know. I know... Catalyst was not doing a lot there. I think they were doing a grinder, but that was about it. So, if there, if anybody knows anything more, go ahead and let me know. I'd be glad to hear. But yeah, from what I understand, it was pretty uneventful. Um, I think Anthony Scroggins was there. I think. No, no, Blaine was there. I know Blaine was there because um, he put up pictures of his wife and kid at, at Gen Con. Um, but yeah. So, anyway. On to the main topic, which talking about tournaments, that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, I don't remember what I was planning on talking about, but this is what I'm talking about because, like I said, I've had a weird, weird time since the last podcast. Um, had some issues with dental issues and a lot of pain. And <laughs> I'm on drugs for pain right now. It's really fun. Like, it's the first ibuprofen I've ever known that acts like it's not ibuprofen. Um, has a special name and everything, and I also have, like, other stuff. So, I have, like, a bajillion old lady pills now. <laughs> Yay me! Anyway, let's talk about the tournament in North Carolina, which I still plan on going on. It looks like I might have a couple people going with me. Awesome. Um, I, I already have, I already have one. Um, there's a possibility of more, though, which is where it gets really interesting. 
Um, so we'll see how this goes. But I want to talk about that tournament because the tournament is from November 7th to November 9th. And the organizer has been really awesome and communicative with me about the rules because I've had a lot of questions. So the first thing I noticed about the rules is that you can score up to 350 margin of victory, which is more points than your opponent that you kill. Um, for those who aren't familiar with the format, because that's an X-Wing thing. So, um, But yeah, so you can score up to three, three, 350 MOV over your opponent, which means table wiping them and taking no damage or taking no casualties. Um, it struck me as kind of odd because theoretically under the 350 system, which is what they it looked like they were using, um, the highest MOV you can score at around is 200. So I asked about this and I was informed the rounds are going to be, that I can't talk. The rounds are going to be played with the entirety of your list. So no building to play with multiple 200 point lists out of, out of a, a stable of 300 points worth of stuff, or no, 350 points worth of stuff. Um, and in my opinion, this adds a great deal of flexibility of the play styles available to the players as you don't require a ton of modularity in the list, but can instead build your list to fill a variety of roles. Okay, so I found this is extremely useful as I've been able to build elements into my list, such as control, brawling, mission-specific units like infantry um, for objective control. And, I mean, it's not like there's not compromise in here. Um, there's actually a lot of it. I, I've been finding myself having to figure out where, you know, where I want my compromise at. Do I go heavier towards the, the brawling capabilities and the firepower or control and, you know rely on those to protect like the mission critical assets such as infantry for capturing bunkers or whatever they might have because they don't have the rule set is not well the rule set is out but the 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 scenarios are not yet um you know or do i go really heavy like on the mission critical stuff and hope that i can score objectives better than my opponent but not take as many casualties that would lead me to lose because I lost too many of the infantry and stuff like that. And of course, you're also going to have your stand-up fights. And if you have a stand-up fight, it's just going to be really nasty if you don't have enough stuff in there that can actually shoot things and kill them, which sounds weird, but yeah. But as far as what to bring, you know, there is that question of scenarios. So at the tournament, they won't be using the scenarios out of the WolfNet packet. Um, they're going to be using their own scenarios. I was told they might. there might be some similarities, but there really isn't too much you can do in a competitive atmosphere of scenarios and, and keep them balanced for that type of play. I mean, because you can't have like historical type scenarios where one side is, is more powerful than the other or like one side's trying to capture an objective and the other one is trying to stop them. It, you know, it, you, you have to build it so each side has essentially the same objective. Um, the, the competitive games start Saturday with conclusion on Sunday. Um, they're, they're not playing overnight. It's six games. I want to say four Saturday to Sunday. Friday evening, there will be free play at the event. Um, so players can get to know each other a bit, maybe get some games in. And I've also checked with the organizer. And while 3D printed miniatures aren't being prohibited at the event it is highly encouraged to use official miniatures. So if you're a newer player or if you have, you know, a t if you have some, some metal or plastic catalyst minis, you know, some iron wind, some catalyst, maybe even some really old uh, FASA city tech that I might be bringing, um, <laughs> you can still bring 3D printed miniatures as well. And, you know, you're not going to be ostracized for it or told you need to leave, which is really awesome because a lot of people don't have the money to, especially newer players, they don't have the money to buy into um, Iron Winds, which that's going to be its whole own episode because stuff. So, um, but 3D, 3D printed miniatures are not prohibited, but it's encouraged to use the official miniatures. You know, and I get that, though, because this is being run by a game store. And they're going to encourage their, 
you know, they're probably close enough to encourage people, hey, while you're dead, while, while there's some downtime, why don't you stop by the store, go grab some stuff, and they're not going to have 3D printed marauders or uh, Timberwolves or whatever from, from MechWarrior Online, you know. I mean, they will have Percivals because that's their house mech. Um, which also, the Percival is legal, but other non-canon mechs or not or custom mechs or unique mechs are not. Um, I will. I think I left a, a link to the rules in the Facebook group. I'll double check them and make sure. So, I mean, that also brings me to the subject. Uh, I've been using a lot of terms like control, firepower, brawlers, mission critical. And I'm using these terms because when it comes down to it, these are the three most basic roles you're going to find in this kind of event, in a tournament. Um, some units can fill different roles and, and be helpful, you know. But these three roles are the most basic in competitive play. So I want to take a look at them real quick because, you know, you're listening already. And if you made it this far, awesome. You might as well hear about why I'm using these terms. So starting with the most basic role there is, the, the brawler or firepower unit. These will usually be brawlers, skirmishers, or even juggernauts. Generally, they'll be your mainline units. Um, usually, they're going to be slow to moderate in speed with a target movement modifier of 1 to 2 and carry firepower of at least four, 4 to 5 or more. Faster units tend to have less firepower than their slower counterparts, but also have the ability to maneuver better as well. These units have one job, hit the enemy hard and just knock them out. Next you have the control units. This group tends to be more varied with a lot of the units in this group being able to fill more than one role. There are generally two kinds of control units, passive and active. Now passive control units carry EW warfare equipment such as ECM, Beagle Active Probes, Angel ECM, etc. That allows them to detect hidden units or interfere with the C3 systems. And the other type of control unit is the active control unit. These units carry systems such as uh, T-Semp, Mech Tasers, um, Battle Armor Tasers, or they'll have the Heat Special Ability. If you're playing in a casual game, or, or if you're playing in a tournament that allows you to have um, Inferno Rounds... <laughs> oh, I complete. I had some stuff happen, I completely lost where it was. But if you have a tournament... So, if you're playing casual or in a tournament where organizers allow you to have Inferno rounds. Um, the improved narc ability can you, well, actually, let me go back a little bit. Because the improved narc ability can use Haywire pods to act in a similar role. And units with the SRM ability can use Inferno rounds to give them the heat ability. And with this ability, you know, this is the most effective on units with the, the ability SRM of 2-2 short and medium as they you can't force an enemy to gain more than two heat in a single turn um, control units also excel at creating a hard time for your opponent by forcing forcing your opponent to deal with um you know they're going to be dealing with higher to hit numbers they're going to be dealing with having uh, slower units or units that get completely shut down by t-semp you know you, you force them to chase do they, do they go after the stuff that's making their day really hard? Or are they going to go after the stuff that is, um, you know, th that you're going to win the game with, such as things that are actually capturing objectives? Give me a sec. Um, and, you know, also with, with control units, there's a bonus of many of them are active and passive. So... In addition to that, they usually perform more, you know, more roles on the battlefield than just one. So, you can have a brawler who's a control unit, or you can have a unit that's like a battle taxi for dropping off battle armor that's a control unit. It, it's not just like, hey, this unit can only do control stuff. They can do a few other things as well. And, you know, finally, you have the mission critical type units. Usually, you're going to see these in every list because you have like weird things that you'll need to do like put guys in a bunker or you know grab an objective and, and get it back but it's going to be easier to do with infantry than it is with the mech because the infantry you can sort of like do different little shenanigans with um they also act as spotters if you're using a direct fire 
but you know it's, there's specialty units and you have to have them because you're going to need them at some point the problem is how many do you bring you know it's 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 that type of thing and of course having access to the scenarios beforehand can help you determine how much of what you need as far as those units and of course like many of the many of the modern tournaments out there do provide tournament packets with information at least a few weeks beforehand so i'm confident that we're going to get like tournament information before we get tournament information um i don't know how else to put that like we're gonna get we're gonna get stuff about the tournament itself um as far as the scenarios and stuff like that i excuse me um I don't plan on, I'm not trying to metagame it, but at the same time, there's sort of like a, you know, you can't avoid it in a way. And it, it just, yeah, it's not, it's not what a lot of people expect as far as tournaments. Like people, people seem to have this idea that you do a tournament and it's, you know, I don't know how to put it. It's really hard to explain. Like, the the idea of the medalist tournament, which a certain group keeps pushing, does not exist. And I say it doesn't exist because I've been building lists for their tournament style. Um, I've been playtest ever since I found out about this tournament. I've been playtesting. I've been, I've been, you know, I I want to go there. I want to have a good time, but also, I'm the girl that broke Tennessee. <laughs> um, so. You know, I am sure that I'm going to have a little bit of a target on my back. And, um, yeah, I just, I really think that they don't understand it. There is a meta. No matter what you do, there's a meta. Uh, the meta in their game is actually, uh, and you can see it, like, in they did, so they did post the, the build-outs. Or not the build-outs, but the, the percentages of units in their tournament. And you can see it in there. It's, it's very skewed towards lighter units. It's very infantry skewed. It's, there's a meta. You, you can't get around that. Every game has a meta. So to say that Wolf, the WolfNet 350 eliminates the meta, I think is wrong. The, the Fool just use all 350 every game, I think is better. It gives you way more... Um, flexibility in your lists it actually makes it feel like alpha strike again and not like some kind of weird alpha strike not game um i still don't like the multiple to hit rolls because i do feel that it devalues the speed capabilities of certain units such as say the jackalope which by the way is an awesome little little tiny mech but yeah the jackalope and dashers and like stuff that's just meant to go fast has like a target move of three or four is suddenly just meh you know so anyway i mean there's that but that's that's mainly our main topic today you know we had a little bit of news we had a little bit of talk about the the november tournament and i am already at the 23 minute mark so what i'm gonna do i'm gonna go ahead let y'all hear the uh well let y'all listen to today's uh, mech tech which i have to double check to see what it is today Alrighty, i found it so here we go let me give you this week's edition of mech tech welcome to another segment of mech tech today we're looking at the goliath c this mo this monster of machine comes in at 80 tons and is a deadly amalgam of clan and inner sphere technology upgraded by clan wolf as an opportunity to garner goodwill with the world of stewart the Goliath was upgraded with a bevy of clan tech equipment. Its biggest gun, which they added on there, is a Gauss rifle, which is mounted on a left torso turret with an ER large laser and a micro pulse laser. It also has a forward mounted advanced tactical missile mine launcher and an, eight, and an ER medium laser. This is all protected under a shell of 14 and a half tons of Case 2 enhanced armor and powered by a 240 standard engine that gives it a top speed of 54 kilometers an hour. In Alpha Strike, the Goliath C is a sniper. 
Its type is battle mech, size 4, target movement modifier of 1, movement of 6, has a short of 6, medium of 5, long of 4, overheat of 0, armor of 8, structure of 6, with specials of case 2, and a turret of 333. Now, in Battletech, the version of the Goliath Sea is... The, the Goliath Sea is deadly. It's downright scary the fact that it can just shoot at you wherever you're pointing but the turret has downsides in battle tech alpha strike it doesn't have quite the same downsides so it has a 360 degree of fire or field of fire with that turret which is over half of its combat capability and it can still fire forward three two one as far as its forward firing capabilities so it may be a sniper as far as the game is concerned, but in all honesty, once you have a turreted mech, that mech becomes a brawler regardless of what they say it is. I mean, for example, if you take a standard Goliath and a Goliath seat and put them in the same situation where they have to fight their way out of something, the standard Goliath is going to have to watch its six constantly. You're... you're the whole time you're going to be wanting to make sure that nobody gets behind you because you are ineffective at that point. With the Goliath C having all that weaponry mounted on a turret, regardless of whether it's Battletech or it's Alpha Strike, you now have the capability to attack people behind you and still have a decent amount of throw weight forward. The other thing about it is, like I said, in Battletech and Alpha Strike, they work a little differently. So, whereas in Battletech, you can have a turret lock or something like that from a critical. In Alpha Strike, turrets don't lock. You can immobilize a tank. You can immobilize a mech. You cannot lock the turret on a mech. So that mech is going to forever and ever be able to shoot 360 degrees. Unless it's dead. Which is one of the interesting things about battle about Alpha Strike as compared to Battletech, where you are looking at designs that are capable of more or less losing a little bit of their combat effectiveness, but they don't lose all of it until you've knocked them off the table. Well, that's our look at the Goliath C. Um, on a personal note, I wanted to bring up the aesthetics of this. Now most of these mechs, I'm not going to talk about the aesthetics. Some of them I might. Like the Marauder. I don't think I've covered that yet. The Marauder. I might talk a little bit about its aesthetics. The, the Mad Cat. Stuff like that where it's got this really aggressive look to it. One of the things I find interesting about the Goliath C in particular is that they kept the Project Phoenix art. So one of the overarching themes that you will see in the O'Clan recognize recognition guy books is that everything has new artwork beautiful artwork amazing artwork except for a couple of them um uh mainly the enforcer anyway <laughs> everything has new artwork except for the goliath seat which i think is really weird because there was this huge push towards the you know people going well the mechs from the Project Phoenix books, or technically not Project Phoenix, it was one book, they don't look right. They, they're too spindly. They're too this. They're too that. There's something wrong with them. The Goliath, for some reason, is acceptable. So, I don't know what to say there. I wish it was just something odd, but it feels like... I don't know. It, it just... It doesn't feel right. It feels like everything got this massive redesign except for the Goliath which the Goliath was not a super good looking mech the original Goliath was the newer Goliath not so much with all that being said though I do hope you enjoyed today's edition of Mech Tech alright so that is our show today um, starting in October with the first week in October actually I will be doing something called uh Cattober. Yes. So everything next month is going to be related to Smoke Jaguars, Nova Cats, Mechs with Cat in the name. Um, 
you name it. Also, I'm going to be doing something special because I can find at least enough mechs to do it in a four-week period. Every weekend, you will be getting a mech tech. Uh, starting off in the first weekend in October with the Cauldronborn, also known as the Ebon Jaguar, or Black Cat, if you just want to simplify Ebon Jaguar down to its basis terms. So anyway, um, remember, go ahead and check us out on Facebook. We have the Facebook group, the Unicorn Company Podcast. Um, I think that's it. I still haven't gotten the Patreon set up yet. I still don't know what to give you all. Um, any suggestions would be awesome. So anyway, y'all have a great day, great evening, great whatever it is where you are. And this is Carrie signing off.